All right, so our next guest is my brand new friend, Ariel Durange. She's a member of the Athabasca Chippewa First Nation of Northern Alberta and is the executive director of Indigenous Climate Action. Now, she joins us now to discuss the impacts of the climate crisis on the health of Indigenous communities in Canada. So, first of all, it's so nice to meet you. Welcome. Nice to meet you, too. Thanks. How, how did Great I do it? How did I do it? Not. Yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> Come on. He warmed up the chair for I you. I know. Let's talk about your community. Um, and the health risks of the climate crisis and how it particularly affects them. Tell me what we're talking about. You know, um, I'm really glad that Bill actually opened up because he talked about the Alberta tar sands. So my community at the Basque Chippewa One First Nation is downstream from the Alberta tar sands. Got so, it. you know, we're feeling the direct impacts of extractivism and the extractive industries that are precipitating the climate crisis right now. But in addition to that, we're also experiencing the impacts of, the cl of climate change in our communities through changing precipitations, the changing of migratory species, and, and all of this is disrupting our cultural and spiritual procurement that we've had with our lands and territories since time immemorial. And it's a real crisis for our communities because we're not just at the front lines of the climate crisis, we're often at the front lines of the very things that are precipitating the climate crisis, like extraction of Alberta's tar sands and other fossil fuels. Yeah, and so I, I can't even imagine what it's like to be downstream all of that. So what's the answer? I mean, in a perfect world, what do we do? You know, I think one of the most interesting things is that we have to think about is that Indigenous peoples don't just live on the front lines. We're not just being impacted by things, but we actually house a lot of really important and critical information and knowledge about ecosystems that are becoming more and more critical to achieving climate st stabilization. You know, the IPCC report that just came out a couple of months ago yep. stated that we have to protect and conserve the biodiversity that's left on this planet. What's really interesting is that 80% of the world's biodiversity exists within Indigenous lands and territories. Our communities aren't just feeling the impacts, but we actually have key solutions to addressing the climate crisis from a, a way that comes from ancestral knowledge. You know, our information and our knowledge systems about the lands and territories comes passed down from us to us through our, our previous generations. And it's absolutely critical that we tap into these knowledge systems in order to find real answers because as much as we need to protect the biodiversity of the environment we have to think about the biodiversity of the human species and the people who are living there educate me a little bit help me understand when we're talking about indigenous people in, in, in Canada and how they're impacted how many communities how many people are we talking about um, indigenous people in Canada represent just under 5% of the population in the country. Um, and so just like, it, it, you know, we're not a huge segment of the population, but we're over 630 indigenous communities across the country. And we exist in some of the most biodiverse rich regions of the country as well. Canada's boreal forest is one of the most important mm. forests of the world. And our communities live in this beautiful, bountiful forest that is not just critical to our culture and our identity, but critical to achieving climate stabilization and you know my community lives in the peace Athabasca Delta it's one of the last remaining freshwater deltas in the world it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and yet we're downstream from the largest industrial fossil fuel project in the world we have two compounding and contradictory things happening and it's the systems of extractivism and the continued attempts of colonization of our people that is pushing us further and further away not just from that connection to our lands and territories but our ability to hold on to those knowledge systems that are going to be critical for the human species' survival. Now, you've been pushing for solutions for the climate crisis that are centered in communities and indigenous knowledge, just like you were just kind of talking about right there. Tell me more about what some of those answers might be, the ones that are handed down and passed down from generation to generation. What are some? You know, I think one of the most interesting things when we talk about what are tangible solutions is these come from solutions that are grounded in knowledge, right? So these come from reconnecting to the land. We often think of the environment as something to protect as an externality, but as Indigenous people, we're taught that it's a part of who we are and our identity. And part of the solutions are attempting to get into a model of decolonization. And a lot of people are like, well, what is that? Yeah. Decolonization in its simplest form is a return of and connection to land. 
We as a species need to return to our connection to land and place. And when we feel that connection to land and place, we're more apt to protect it, preserve it, and care for it. Yeah. We have to make, reconnect not just our bodies, but our spirits. You know, a lot of my elders and a lot of our people in our communities talk about the climate crisis, not just being an environmental crisis, but a spiritual crisis. A spiritual crisis, crisis as spiritual well. Spiritual crisis. I, I, you know, hearing you say it, it just rings so true to me because if we are removed from the land, how do you care about what you're protecting? Absolutely. And you know, I think that's what we're really trying to achieve is that indigenous solutions aren't often really obvious, you know. Our solutions aren't necessarily rooted in economic solutions and, you know, wind turbines and technology. But what they're rooted in is this connection to land. Reclaiming our cultures, our identities, and our languages are a part of the suite of solutions mm -hmm. to address the crisis. And we can share our intimate knowledge and relationships outside of our communities and start to build a world of people that are more connected and decolonized and really pushing the agenda to really achieving that connection to land and place. With so many headlines that aren't hopeful, what's a hopeful message that we can kind of end the conversation with? You know, I think that humanity has been such a wonderful thing. You know, we've evolved and we've grown over the, the centuries and we have this a beautiful ability to continue to evolve. And a lot of people think of this crisis as scary and overwhelming, but it's actually an opportunity, an opportunity for us to not just reconnect with the land and place, but each other. Our solutions have to be diverse, just like humanity. Ariel, I'm following you on social media. You're amazing. Thank you so much for Thank spending you. some time with us, and honestly, and sharing your story Thank with you so us and, and the world tonight.